All right, we're kind of spread out now. I'm kind of focusing. So if you want, if you want to see me full, full front, you got to come over here. But you don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> All right, I wasn't, didn't know what to expect as far as numbers this morning with all the doom and gloom about the possible snow, but didn't materialize, so we're okay. No, no, no. Yes, tonight. Yes, this is Sunday school. Make sure you're in the right place. All right. All right, before we get started, we'll have a word of prayer. Does anybody have any special prayer requests we want to remember? Yes, Karen. Sandra would dearly love to have that baby. Oh, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Have the baby. The labor's on again and off again, and she's four days overdue. Oh. She's great for her. She can have a They're having another boy, is that right? Yes, Jack. Oh. I just wanted to say praise that um, my sister-in-law is doing better, and she doesn't need as much pain medication. Oh, good. <laughs> Kara Battler shared a, a phrase Betty's really perked up here in the last week, so that's good. She also shared this uh, because she has a granddaughter attending Asbury uh, College or University, actually in Kentucky, and apparently there's uh, a, a spread of the gospel and salvation going on there. They've had services every day for a week now, and it's uh, continuing on. Her, her granddaughter said this is amazing to see. She's not seen anything like this. Enjoy that. All right. Good. Yeah, Dan, Dan was telling me uh, to mention John Chisholm. He's got an interview tomorrow. We may change careers in the highway patrol or something like that. Oh. Okay. So. Good. Good. A, a phrase for a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. She and her husband got married the same year we did. Well, they were separated, but planning to divorce. They got back together again. Right. Well, that's nice to hear. All right, well, let's go ahead and start with prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to meet together. Thank you for bringing us here safely. We thank you for the praises that were shared and how you were working. Pray that you would continue to work in the lives of these folks that were mentioned. We do. Pray especially for Sandra. We pray you be with her and the baby. We pray you give them a safe delivery and watch over them. We pray for John Chisholm and this possible change. Pray for your guidance for him. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we look at your word and we look at the wonderful ways in which you worked there early in the church in Acts. And we pray that you teach us through your word and help us to be better equipped and motivated to serve you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we're in Acts 18. <clears throat> I tell you, I've read through Acts many, many times in my life, but studying it through to teach it, you really learn so much more. And, you know, teaching is not something that comes natural to some people, including me. But I tell you, when you teach the Bible, it's amazing how much you learn. And... You know, I definitely receive more than I, I give. So that's an encouragement to anybody else who's considering teaching. But Acts 18, this is, we're at the end of the second missionary journey. Um, where are we? So, Paul, you see where we're at? We were in Athens last week. And so we're at the end of the second missionary journey. Paul Paul is alone at this point, if you remember in Athens. Look at chapter 17, verse 14. Uh, then immediately the brethren, this is in Berea, the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So Silas and Timothy stay up in Macedonia, the northern part of what is now Greece. And Paul went to Athens. And you, Chris taught us about his ministry there in Athens. He, he was solo there. And that brings us then to eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So, the circumstances, why he left Athens, how he traveled to Corinth, we're not told. 
but he goes to Corinth. Corinth is about 50 miles from Athens, but characteristically, it's, it's very different. And how would you describe Athens as a city? What was it known for? Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan. <laughs> the knowledge. Knowledge, philosophy. Philosophy. philosophy, learning. It was all about learning and culture and all that. Well, Corinth was a little bit different. <laughs> Corinth is known for commerce, for extravagance, for indulgence, for immorality. So kind of the opposite of Athens. And that's where Paul is going. Corinth is known for trade and travel. There are two seaports in Corinth. So all land and sea trade went through Corinth. And that, that was part of its problem. You know, when people move through it, it's one of the two most important cities visited by Paul, the other one being Ephesus. It was a Roman colony, so it was important politically, and it was the capital of the province of Achaia. So in, um, in what is now Greece, up here is Macedonia, and then down here is Achaia, Corinth being the capital of that whole region. So it was a very important city. But as I say, it was known for immorality. There was a constant flow of people. I remember I, I toured Ephesus many years ago. And in Ephesus, they, when they unearthed and excavated the city of Ephesus, they found on the sidewalks, they noticed little symbols kind of dotting a path from the seaport into the city. And they determined that what that was, was that was a way for people coming to the seaport, like sailors and traders, it led them to the brothels in the city. And that's, that, that was Ephesus, but Corinth was the same way. And it was known for its, its immorality. In addition, it was known for, it was a center of worship for a um, certain goddess, Aphrodite. She is the goddess of love, Valentine's Day, right? But not the kind of love we're talking about. It was basically Aphrodite promoted immorality in the name of religion. They were known to have a thousand temple prostitutes in the, in the temple of Aphrodite. This is a, one of the more modest uh, sculptures of Aphrodite. There are some other ones that are less modest, but uh, that's Aphrodite. In fact, Plato, it's recorded that Plato referred to prostitutes as Corinthian girls. <laughs> so Corinth, Corinth was not known for its righteousness. So this is where Paul is headed. Paul is going to Corinth and he's going alone. Do you think there may have been some hesitancy? Maybe. And we get a hint of this. Well, first, why, why was he a little bit uh, hesitant? We said, mentioned one thing, he was alone. Why else maybe? Did he have some, some trepidation? Well, certainly the uh, reputation of Corinth. Also, remember, where is he coming from? What happened in Philippi? He was imprisoned, right? What happened in Thessalonica? They ran him out of town. What happened in Berea? <laughs> Same thing. So he, he'd just been through a lot of harrowing experiences through the ministry now he's left alone because his friends stayed up in Macedonia, and he's come into Corinth, of all places. We get a hint of how he was looking at this by looking at 1 Corinthians. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And by the way, do you think there's some correlation between the book of Acts and the epistles? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious, but right? But you know, the, the letters, the epistles are letters to the people and the cities that we read about in Acts. So you always want to keep that in mind when you're studying those together. It's great to flip back and forth because it's amazing how much insight you get from the epistles. And here's an example of that, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Listen to what Paul says to them. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. So that kind of tells you where Paul was, what kind of mental state he was in as he goes to Corinth.
that's verse 1. And then verse 2 and 3, we see, I, I like to see this as God's provision for Paul. I mean, Paul, God knew Paul's emotional state, that he was a little bit hesitant. He was a little bit on the weak side emotionally. So here's what happens. Verse 2. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. So here, Paul is in this uh, terribly immoral city by himself, and all, it seems like almost immediately he hooks up with Aquila and Priscilla. What a, what a blessing. Now, we're told that they were Jewish. At least Aquila was Jewish. We assume Priscilla was also. It says they were displaced from Rome. What had happened was that the emperor Claudius had given an edict that all Jews had to leave Rome. Why? Well, historians tell us that there were, the dis, there were disputes between the non-Christian Jews and the Jewish Christians concerning whether or not the, pre, the preaching of Jesus Christ as Messiah. And evidently, these Jews had gotten so impassioned that the disputes were spilling out onto the streets. And they were having frequent riots, the Jew against Jew, some saying, no, Jesus is the Messiah, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. Finally, the emperor Claudius said, I'm not putting up with this. Y'all have to leave. <laughs> or as they say in the South, all y'all had to leave. So he just said, all Jews have to leave Rome. That's one way to take care of your problems. Now, he didn't ban them from Italy, just from the city of Rome. So all the Jews had to leave Rome. Um, so for whatever reason, uh, Aquila and Priscilla go to Corinth. We're not told why. We presume it was for business. They probably went there for a business opportunity. Now, were they believers when Paul met up with them? And we're not told, uh, but most sources think that they probably were believers. A couple reasons for that. One is, certainly if Paul led them to, to, uh, to conversion, you'd think it would be recorded. So nothing's said about that. Plus, just the fact that, that Paul... Uh, linked up with them so quickly and readily suggests that they were of like mind. So we assume that they were already believers. And we're told that Paul stayed with them and worked with them. They had a mutual trade, that of tent making. Now, what I read is that the term, the Greek word for tent making doesn't necessarily just means they make tents. It can also be applied to the idea of leather workers. So it's probable that they probably did make tents. Most tents were made out of goat's hair but they were also leather workers. So they made belts and other things out of leather. So they were probably leather workers. Now, typically in those cities, the, you know, you buy a building, the shop would be downstairs, the living quarters would be upstairs. So presumably they had enough room. Paul just lived with them in a spare room up there. Now we're told that Paul was a tent maker. Now you've probably heard that term in, in, in our churches, when, when we talk about missions, we talk sometimes about a tent maker. So what, is that, what, what does that mean to us as far as when people talk about being a tent maker? Mike. Right. Right. It's someone involved in ministry but works a secular job to support themselves. That's, we, we'll say that's tent making. That's where this term comes from. Paul was a tent maker. Now, there are examples in Paul's writing where he, he gladly received gifts from people, give, monetary gifts, especially from the Philippians. But he, as far as we know, he had no regular support, no regular salary. So he worked when, when necessary. And apparently that was necessary here. He needed to work. You got to have money to live, buy food. So he was a tent maker. And Paul mentions this several times through his writings, which we're going to look at. Now, I want you to, we're going to look at these passages where Paul references his tent making. I want you to answer this question. Why do you think Paul mentions this so often? So let's look at Acts chapter 20. And he's talking to the Ephesian elders here. Acts 20, verse 33. He says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. Okay, then let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 
1 Corinthians 4, 12, he says, And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. All right, then 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 2, 9, he says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. And then one more, 2 Thessalonians 3, 8. He says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So why do you think Paul mentioned that so often as a reminder? What was he expressing? Hmm? How was he unlike some other people that were peddling the gospel? He was not peddling it. He, he, wanted, he wanted to be clear that he was not motivated by financial gain. I mean, I, I think that's why he kept bringing it up. He's saying, look... I, I worked because I didn't want you to think that I was doing it for the money. So that's an interesting sidelight about Paul. So that's what we mean by him being a tent maker. Any questions or comments about that idea? Well, there's other ways which could um, be selfish, um, you know, not just for financial gain. Prestige, yeah. You know, loneliness. Yeah. Right. But I think, in, especially in that culture, think about Corinth being a place for commerce and trade. He wanted it clear that he wasn't there for the money. <laughs> he was doing this because he was doing God's will, and he's willing to work for his own keep. It's oh, important to yes. take note, though, however, that he did mention elsewhere that he could have expected. Sure, sure. He, he was, was not saying, saying this is the only way. It was, right. But for him, that was important. You're right. right. Yeah. What apparently was common criticism at the time. Right. And possibly a person might face that in their own culture or situation now. And at least his example shows that we should be willing to do that, you know, if it's important for the advancement of the gospel. Absolutely. I was impressed by that one verse that we looked at there that said he even worked diligently enough to support others that yeah, were with him. Yeah. So he was a busy man, yeah. hard worker. Right. Okay, then verse 4, moving on. As was his custom, he reasons in the synagogue every Sabbath. Now, it's interesting that here and in Athens, in chapter 17, it says that he, he reasoned in the synagogue, persuaded both Jews and Greeks. You know, we say that he went to the synagogue because that was his heritage. His, he first went to the Jews. But here and in Athens, the last city he was in, it mentions specifically, he went to the synagogue, but he really was ministering both Jews and Gentiles. You know, that's been brought out many times that in most synagogues, there were also Gentile God worshipers. And so he was ministering to both. Then we get to verse 5. Verse 5 is a very interesting verse. It says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, so Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. First, let's talk about that. That really was a great encouragement and blessing to, Tim to Paul for several reasons. First, evidently, they brought with them financial aid. And we know that by looking at 2 Corinthians. Let's look at a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So 2 Corinthians 11, 9, he says, And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, so will I keep myself. So apparently they came and brought with them some financial resources, which would free Paul up from his tent making somewhat. We'll talk about that. Secondly, he was encouraged by a good report brought from Timothy. Again, let's look at 1 Thessalonians. So remember, where was Paul, where were uh, Timothy and Silas? They were up 
Thessalonica and Berea, right? That's where he had left them. But we read in 1 Thessalonians 3, which, by the way, first, the, the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians were written from Corinth when Paul was there. So shortly after he left Thessalonica, he's in Corinth, he writes these letters. So 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, he says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you, talking about Timothy and Silas coming to meet him, and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. So not only had they brought monetary aid, evidently, they also brought a good report of where they were. And then lastly, his companionship was restored. You know, Paul was a, a great minister, but if you read, almost always he is working with a team. Almost never do you find Paul by himself, except this period here in Athens and Corinth. I'd like to recommend a book to you. It's called In Paul's Shadow. It's a, the subtitle is Friends and Foes of the Great Apostle. It's published by Bob Jones Press. But it talks about all the people that Paul worked with and some that he worked against. But it's a very good story. If you want background information about Aquila and Priscilla and then Apollos and all these people, Timothy and Silas. But let me just read one little section in the introduction. It says, The story of Acts suggests that Paul personally felt a deep need for the presence of fellow workers in his missionary activities. He knew the strength that comes from companionship and wisely made it a practice always to have some assistance with him in his missionary labors. Only once in Athens was Paul left without any of his co-workers. So keenly did Paul feel the need of their presence that he sent back word at once to Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So them coming would have been a great boost to him. And remember, how did he, how did he enter Corinth? He was a little bit down, right, emotionally. He was a little, a little scared, a little, a little worried. And here come Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy, and that really bolsters his outlook. Now, I want to look at verse 5 because it's kind of, sometimes you don't understand. It says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And it's interesting that the different versions kind of, uh, translate this differently. And I think this is a good lesson on translations because it does give you an idea of the differences. You, we always think that, well, some, some versions are more literal than others. And whereas that's generally true, that doesn't always follow. And this is a good example. In this verse, it's the, the King James says that he was pressed by the Holy Spirit. The New King James says that he, that he was um, compelled or constrained, that is actually the most literal translation. Which, what does that mean? He was constrained by the Holy Spirit. Well, let's look at some of the other versions, and the other versions actually take a much less literal approach, but maybe increase the understanding. The NIV says, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews. The ESV, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews. And the New American Standard, which we usually think of as more literal, it's actually the, most, the least literal. It says, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews. And by looking at all those, I think it gives us a better picture of what's going on here. The idea is that when they came, who is Jesus? And you
opportunity to go back to that. Yeah. And it's we don't determine truth. Exactly. It's not our truth. That is that is such a lie, you know, in our culture now. And and it's when it comes down to what you believe about spiritual truth, it can determine your destiny. Sure. It's extremely important. You can be sincere all you want, but you can also be sincerely wrong. Mm-hmm. Your sincerity does not save you. It's the object of your faith that saves you, which has to be the biblical Jesus Christ. Paul told them that he was fearful that they would accept another Jesus and another gospel. And now we have a culture that is putting out ads during very wicked things like the Super Bowl or halftime or the Super Bowl. Jesus gets us. What Jesus? What Jesus? But what they they don't say is Jesus is the Christ. Right. That's the part they leave out. Well, even the, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before, we had Mormon neighbors for many years up in Virginia, and they would frequently say to us, well, we really, we really believe a lot of the same stuff. <laughs> but then we would always bring it back, yeah, but, but what do you say about Jesus? And that's where we differed, big. And they, they you know, and that, so that's really the crux of the matter. So I find it interesting that that was Paul's emphasis. Well, moving on to verse 6. Despite this renewed focus on his ministry to Jews, we see the pattern repeating itself. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, okay, so once again, there's Jewish opposition. It says they opposed him, blasphemed. Blaspheme is the idea of insults or accusations or threats. So what does Paul do? Like he does, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. For now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So again, we see it full circle. He emphasizes the Jews. They oppose him. He turns to the Gentiles. Now there's two, two phrases there. First it says he shook out his garments. So what, what does that signify? Yeah, he's done with them, right? He don't want anything to do. He don't even want the dirt, the dust of them on his clothes. We saw that with Paul and Barnabas in Antioch of Pisidia in chapter 13. They, they shook off the dust. And you remember Jesus said that to the twelve. He said, if they won't listen to you, shake off the dust as a testimony against them. Well, then what else did he do? He declared, your blood be upon your own heads. I am innocent. What did that signify? He did what he did. And even though they're bound for destruction, the blood, it's on them. It's their own responsibility. And there are many, many passages in the Old Testament with that phraseology, especially in Ezekiel, where he talks about the watchman. And if the watchman tells you that it's coming, but you ignore him, well, your blood's on your own heads. And that's what he was saying. So he's turning from the Gentiles now to, I mean, to the, from the Jews to the Gentiles. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. This is amazing to me. This really shows me the amazing work of God, how he orchestrates this. It says, and he departed from there, meaning the synagogue. He was fo- his ministry was focused in the synagogue, primarily to the Jews. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> so, kind of as a symbolic gesture, he walks out of the synagogue and says, I'm done with you all. He, <laughs> he goes right next door and enters the house of Justice. Now, you talk about a fortunate move for a new uh, center for his preaching ministry. He goes right next door, and who was Justice? Which means he was a Gentile, right? It doesn't say he was a Gentile, but he calls him a worshiper of God, which is usually that term means a Gentile. So he leaves the synagogue, all the Jews, goes next door to a Gentile's house, a God worshiper, and he says, this is where I'm going to base my teaching from. Then look what happens. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. (laughs) So nothing's happening in the synagogue, you know. Nobody's listening. In fact, the Jews are arguing with him, insulting him. He leaves and goes into the house of a Gentile. Immediately, the leader of the synagogue becomes a Christian. Now, the leader of the synagogue doesn't necessarily mean he's a rabbi, but it was the person that was in charge of the synagogue. He ran the thing. He made sure things were ready. He made sure the meetings took place. When the, so he was an important person. He becomes a believer. Isn't it interesting? All the time Paul was in the synagogue, he didn't become a believer, but then he leaves, he becomes a believer. And his whole household. Have we seen that before? Yeah, the, jailer. the jailer, 
Other? Lydia? Lydia? Uh, Cornelius. What's that? Cornelius. Cornelius. His whole household heard and was later baptized. Right. So, and then, what's the next sentence, sentence say? And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So it's almost like the floodgates opened. Here, Paul was following the Lord's leading, working in the synagogue, primarily talking to Jews. Nothing's happening. They're opposing him. They're insulting him. He finally says, that's it. I'm leaving. And boom, God uses. That just goes to show you that, you know, sometimes God will make us make a change. And sometimes we're not real happy about it. But look at this. I mean, this was God's plan all along. So it says, many Corinthians believed. And it does, it's, it's probably Jews and Gentiles. So all of a sudden, ministry starts blossoming and people are saved. Now notice the uh, progression there. It says they, they heard, they what? Believed, believed and were baptized. baptized. Now, this is the, the correct order, right? <laughs> you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, you, you get baptized. Now, Evidently, in the, in the book of Acts, that is the typical order of events. You read that, think of Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, right? People heard, they believed, were baptized, often within days. Is that what we see today in our culture? <laughs> no. Let's try something. Has anybody in this room, is your testimony such that the very first time you heard the gospel, you believed it, and within days you got baptized? Anybody? Steve? Okay, I mean, it, it's possible. I mean, it's certainly, it's biblical. But it doesn't happen like that anymore, right? And I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. My point is that we've talked about the book of Acts really is a book of, it's a transitional period. God was working in a very special way among the, with the birth of the church. And you see this frequently. People hear, they believe, they're baptized. We don't see that today. And again, I'm not saying that's, bad, but it just shows you that, that God was moving, his spirit was moving in a special way during the book of Acts. And that's why, you know, we look at the book of Acts, we certainly want to learn from it, but sometimes people say, well, that's not the way they did it in Acts. We need to get back to doing it. Well, that was a special time, and we have to be careful about copying it, you know, because God do, did work in kind of a special way during the, the birth of the church. And here's one of those examples. Any questions on that? I don't want to be confusing, but I thought that was interesting. Yes, um, was Rex. Chris, was Chris um, a Gentile? No, he would, he would have been a Jew. Oh, okay. They put a, he was the chief ruler of this synagogue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we presume he was Jewish because he was a ruler of the synagogue, right? All right, and that brings us, yes. The yeah, scripture doesn't give any mandate in regard to the timing of baptism right. there. But the examples that you have in Acts, even though they're not, even though they are descriptive as opposed to prescriptive, you know, they're not, their description is not binding upon us. It does raise the question of what benefit is there to a prolonged time of baptism. One of the importances here, which we often overlook now, is that their baptism was a public identification <laughs> with the message. Right. It was a part of their witness. Right. Yep. And, right. and that's very important. And actually, it's one of those things that when we do have a baptismal opportunity, you know, we should encourage the people being baptized to invite friends, family, mm -hmm. make it a public thing, not just the church thing. You know, have it, you know, try to, you know, use it to enhance that testimony. And we know that a person's not going to come to faith unless the Holy Spirit is doing that work. But, but we are also a part of that work that he does with our witness. And so this is kind of important even to the momentum of the gospel right here. As people openly saw people embracing, leaving their former lifestyle, saying, I do believe that Jesus is the Christ. You know, it's a really important you know, part of all that. Sure. And sometimes I think the church is a little protective of baptism, and uh, maybe for their own reasons, like we don't want to baptize too soon unless the person doesn't follow. And it's like, I'm not sure that's a huge consideration. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with making sure a person knows what they believe so that it's a truly meaningful experience. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, we need to be careful that we don't change it also <coughs> into something else. Sure. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, you've been very gentle and very considerate, but let's get down to one other aspect of this uh, discussion, and that is that uh, within Christendom, even among some evangelicals, there is a view that uh, baptism should be applied to infants. Mm -hmm. And the uh, theological strain there tends to be that this is the New Testament equivalent to circumcision mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. So uh, a baby is basically uh, baptized uh, to bring them into the community of, of Christians. Now that is specifically not scriptural. Right. And uh, what you find is you, you find some people say, well, I've been baptized. I was baptized as an infant, just like all my, all the rest of my church. And that, that is explicitly not scriptural. Right. And this, this order of events, that's why that's so important. There's hearing, then there's true saving faith, then baptism. Yeah. And that argues against that idea. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah, I wonder how many uh, people were, were with the Ethiopian when Philip baptized in a made a couple, you know. True, but in 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 the the early church, I mean that the idea of um, being a testimony and happening immediately, like Steve said, that was definitely part of it. That was why baptism often followed right after. <coughs> but you're right. I mean, and we can have the discussion about baptism, the different ramifications. I've known churches that require a time frame. Say, no, you can't. Can't be after you make a profession of faith, you have to let three to six months before you get baptized. Right. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> baptism is also, I think, uh, there's an aspect of obedience involved. Sure. Obedience to the faith and obedience to the Lord and obedience to this um, mm -hmm. e example, you might say. And I think perhaps that might have been what the eunuch was thinking, I, you know. Um, but anyway, also, if we look back through church history, there was a time in the 15, 1600s when a group of people were called Anabaptists. Anna means again. So they were the rebaptizers because they had all been baptized, as everybody right. in Europe was at that point, as infants. Right. But, this but they realized that when they believed, baptism. they should be baptized, and so they were baptized again. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment that you said the difference then versus today. You, today you also find a very a, a dominance of people that they're not sure whether or not they're saved and they want reassurance of salvation all like that. And a lot of times that comes along at the same time. Well, they didn't take the next step of trying to make a public profession and, and make it real in their lives. Right. But I've also been in churches where if someone comes forward at the invitation to get saved, they immediately march them back to the Baptist, the baptistry in Duncan. And I'm not too sure that's such a good idea in today's, in, in our culture either. Yes, John. One of the things that, you know, I have experienced and have struggled with is the word baptize has two different meanings in the scripture in reference to what I see here and I understand here. This is water baptism as opposed to baptism by the as Spirit. opposed yeah. to the Bible says when you accept Christ as your Savior you are baptized with the Holy Spirit so that I think is the difference that this is referring yeah, this to this is water obviously baptism. talking to believers baptism in water right. Right. all right I'm going to stop the discussion there just because <laughs> we could talk about this for another hour but let's move on verse 9 now, what happens in 9 to 11, we're not told the time, and we don't know when this happened, this during what Paul's time in Corinth. We assume it was early on, but it, not necessarily. But it says, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Remember, Paul already expressed that he had fear, right? He had, he had uh, the past events that have happened, these new threats. And he says that, that God appears, the Lord appears and says, do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Okay. Why is fear a bad thing in ministry? It's What's that? Intimidation is strange. Intimidation is strange. It distracts you. Sometimes causes hesitancy, right? 
Paul was dealing with fear. Remember, Paul was human. You know, we look at Paul as saying, oh, the great missionary. He was, but he was human. Mm -hmm. Evidently, he was dealing with fear. So what does the the Lord say in this vision specifically? You know, he didn't, God didn't come to him and just say, Paul, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. No, what did he say specifically? What was the first thing he said? Don't fear. Then what's what's the second thing? Speak. Speak out. Don't be silent. What's the third thing? Don't hold back. Well, he says, I will protect you. Nothing's going to happen to you. And then the fourth thing? No, I'm going to you. Right. And then what's the last thing he says? I have many people here. What was he talking about? <laughs> Remember verse 8? Verse 8 says that... Uh, Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, current and future believers. God says, I have many people here. God's people, his chosen people, right? Remember back in chapter 13, he said, as many as were appointed unto salvation believed. These are God's chosen people. So what's the significance here? The significance is in these two, these two, this vision from the Lord... He is dealing with two two concepts. Both begin with E. Election and evangelism. Evangelism, right. Together. (laughs) Election and evangelism. Some people have a problem with those, putting those together. And I just want to read a little thing from Warren Wearsby about this, which I thought he really nailed it. Because, you know, we can talk about election and... uh, free will and evangelism. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe says. It says, Paul was encouraged not only by the presence of the Lord, but also by his promises. Jesus assured Paul that no one would hurt him and that he would bring many sinners to the Savior. The statement, I have many people in this city, implies the doctrine of divine election, for the Lord knows those who are his. God's church is made up of people who were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Please note that divine sovereignty and election is not a deterrent to human responsibility and evangelism. Quite the opposite is true. Divine election is one of the greatest encouragements to the preaching of the gospel. Because Paul knew that God already had people set apart for salvation, he stayed where he was and preached the gospel with faith and courage. Paul's responsibility was to obey the commission. God's responsibility was to save sinners. If salvation depends on sinful man, then all of our efforts are futile. But if salvation is of the Lord, then we can expect him to bless his word and save souls. Scripture nowhere dispels the mystery of election, and we should beware of any who try to systematize it too precisely or rigidly. It is not likely that we shall discover a simple solution to a problem which has baffled the best brains of Christendom for centuries. The important thing is that we accept God's truth and act on it. Paul did not spend his time speculating about divine sovereignty and human responsibility the way some ivory tower Christians do today. He got busy and tried to win souls to Christ. You and I do not know who God's elect are, so we take the gospel to every creature and let God do the rest. Amen. I thought that's about the best I've heard it explained. Yep. Okay, so... Paul then is encouraged by the Lord. We read in verse 11, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months. That's his second longest recorded stay, the longest being in Ephesus that we'll read about later. But what was he doing that those 18 months? He was working hard. <laughs> he was working hard. What was he doing specifically there in the verse? Teaching the word of God among them. What do we call that? What, what? Discipleship. And isn't that, that's, that's what the Great Commission is, right? Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to observe all things what I have commanded you. So Paul was demonstrating that. So, you know, I, I just marvel at the way God worked in Corinth. Even among Paul's weakness, God used him in a great way. I want to leave you with one thought, and this is kind of homework. I'm giving you a thinking assignment. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not raising controversy, but I'm just mentioning this for you to think about. And next week, we're going to spend the first five or ten minutes talking about this. But there in verse 
10 when he says, I have many people in this city. Now he's talking about, God's talking about his chosen people. Who, who was God's chosen people in the Old Testament? Jews. Jews. Who is he taught, saying are his people here? The Believers, the church, right? So does this verse lend support to the idea that the church is replacing Israel as God's chosen people? So think about that. I'm not saying what I think yet. But <laughs> some suggest that this verse supports that idea that the church has is re, has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. Israel. So we'll talk about that next week. All right. Let's close in prayer. Chuck, before you go, I, just, I had a thought when we were talking about okay. um, verse 9. Yeah. Do you think that want that... Um, Paul had thought, a thought in the flesh. Do you think that that could have been the fear, mm -hmm. not necessarily a physical sure. disability? Sure, that's what is mentioned. You know, when people say the possible possibilities of his thorn in the flesh, mm -hmm. they list that as one, that his emotional weakness, fear, certainly. But, you know, to me, though, that's, we all have that. I mean, is there anybody here that's never had fear? <laughs> so... That's a common one, but yeah, I've had I have read that 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 was he was saying that was his thorn in the flesh. The point is, Paul was just like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had his strengths, he had his weaknesses, but God used him in a great way. It was you. Yeah. Yes, George. Uh, first, the commandment uh, in uh, Matthew uh, 28, 20, about sharing the gospel to all nations. And that can be intimidating in fear of you, knowing what you're going to be confronted with, let's confront with all of us confront with that. But the word I like uh, is, uh, and woe, I know he says, an absolute comfort and assurance in the well, speaking of comfort, in that, that vision from the Lord, to me, that whole idea of election and evangelism, that also dispels the fear. Because the idea is, our job is to proclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. The salvation of that person is, depends on God and them. I mean, that's not our responsibility. So that also can help take that fear away. And I think that's part of the message that he was given. He says, these are my people. So you just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll take, as Warren Wearsby says, let leave the rest to God. Sure, mm -hmm. Jesus himself. Yeah. I think it's interesting when he, Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. There's fish in the water. He guarantees it, but he had to teach them how to fish. And, that and we don't pick the ones that thing. we catch either. Right. <laughs> so. Or if we catch something every time we go out. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, good. Good thoughts. Let's go to the closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is so rich in teaching and in equipping us for the work that you have for us. Lord, we've only scratched the surface. We pray, Lord, you would help us to be students of your word. We, we, would, we would be thankful that we are your chosen people, not because we deserve it, but because of your grace and mercy. And Lord, help us to be faithful, as Paul was, even in the face of fear and doubts and other weaknesses. Help us, Lord, to be willing to serve you as you lead us. We pray that you will bless as we meet together for the worship service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.